And uh, then um, I'm going to try to, to study it from a, a finite dimensional construction. So the first half of the talk, I'll, I'll talk about this, but it's not here. So how to construct this modular space um, and its symmetric structure uh, using finite dimensional techniques. And this is sort of following the first steps of the quasi Hamiltonian geometry, and it's, it's very similar. And then uh, in the second half of the talk, I'm just going to go into some examples. So uh, we can do some, I mean, besides just uh, constructing the moduli space for, for just a, say, closed surface or something like that, um, we can also take surfaces with boundary and do, do enclosed certain boundary conditions. So we're going to talk about uh, those that will come up in, in, in the example shown in the second half of the talk. So, if the first half of the world is see, I think these examples will, will be uh, easy for everyone. And finally, since I have some content, I, I might mention something about talking about structures at the end of the talk. Uh, okay, so, um, so when we're talking about the modular space of class connections, we can usually fix a quadratic Lie alpha as a set. So, that's a, a Lie alpha with an invariant symmetric line. And uh, then we, we take a, a surface. And we look at a principal bundle over that surface uh, with uh, this structure group. This structure group uh, has, has this as its alpha and, uh, and preserves the, the inner product as well. And uh, if you look at the space of, of flat connections on that principal bundle, it carries a, a piecemeal form. And, um, but, but we also have some symmetries in it. So um, over each fiber, um, and it, on, along each fiber of a principal app, um, and of course act by the structure group. But we can also look at maps from our surface and our structure group and, and act on different fibers by different elements of the structure group. And so, so that's, that's this, uh, this group here, that maps from my surface into my structure group. And if, if I take the quotient, um, it's going to apply connections by, by this, uh, this uh, group, uh, which is usually called the gauge transformations. Um, I, get a, I get a synthetic structure, and I actually get something higher than that. So th this is something that was, that was shown by Dan Bach. Um, but of course, this uses some sort of infinite dimensional uh, reduction. So we're going to look at this, this same sort of construction, but we're going to try to do it in, um, using finite dimensional techniques instead. So first, let's just look at how to, how to look at the modular space from a finite dimensional picture. So what we do is we start by trying to do the surface. So one way to do that is to, to take the principal cycles and you just cut along those principal cycles. So that gives you a polygon. And then it's easy to try and break that polygon. So, so of course there's some edges, some edges identified in this polygon. We identify those edges between the surface. But uh, it's easy to try and break that polygon. Now a flat connection on a surface um, assigns an element of, of a structure group to each edge. That's the, the whole monomial of the flat section along that edge. And uh, the moduli space of flat connections is more or less a um, reflection of all possible coherence assignments of whole monomial to the edges. So what do I, what do I mean by coherent? Well, um, since the connection is flat and a, a given triangle is simply connected, the total whole monomial around that triangle should be trivial. So in this picture, G1 times G2 should be equal to G3. Okay, so, so the idea um, for a finite dimensional construction is to, to start with the triangulation. And uh, we're going to reconstruct the surface by piecing together these, these small <coughs> pipes of triangulation. So since we're interested in the moduli space of flat connections, it makes sense to, to look at the moduli space of flat connections over each of these little pieces. The, the vertices, the edges, the triangles. So let's do that and, and see what structure those carry. So first of all, let's look at the at, at the one simplex. I mean, we'll we'll just skip the zero simplex. Um, so let's look at the one simplex. So suppose we have a um, principal G bundle over that one simplex. So so some, just some interval. The one simplex is just this interval here. Suppose we have a principal G bundle over it. I'm just going to assume it's trivial. Um, because we, we could, of course, realize it. Um, so a flat connection on that, that, on that bundle just looks like a foliation. Now, if we fix um, 
And I'll look at the first fiber of the bundle, the AP knot. I can pull along that foliation to get an element for my second fiber, or my final fiber. And the difference of those two elements is, is, is what's called the holding point. So this gives us a map from the space of flat connections over the interval to, to our structure group G. Um, now, of course, we're interested in, in taking the quotient by, by the space of gauge transformations. But I'm not going to look at all gauge transformations. I'm going to look at those gauge transformations which, which fix the, the initial fiber, fiber and the end fiber. Since I, they fix those fibers, well, I mean, such gauge transformations may not be the interior, but since they fix the initial and the end fiber, the difference of these two elements is the same. So it preserves the whole element. So the whole thing descends from that from, from the quotient to the structure group. And it, it's actually an isomorphic. Now you may wonder why I'm, I'm taking the quotient by this side, this, this subgroup of, um, this normal subgroup of, of base page transformations, which, which act trivially on the two end fibers. And the reason for doing that is because later I'm going to try to, to, to join, join edges together at their, at their end points. So to, to, to join them, I need to retain some information about the connection that, that lives over those edges. So I need to, I need to refrain from acting at the, at the initial and end fibers of those edges so that I can still, still connect, you know, join the connections along them. But I, I will need to, to remember what gauge transformations I, I, I have enacted at on, um, which gauge transformations I, I refrain from, by, uh, um, from acting by. So, so those are the residual gauge transformations. So, so of course I have the, the set of whole gauge transformations which acts on, on the space of flat mechanisms over the edge. Um, and uh, the, the space of uh, base gauge transformations is a normal subgroup. Um, and uh, so, so the, the quotient acts on, 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 on the quotient here. So the, the quotient of, the, of these two groups acts on the on quotient space. Now I can use the whole domain map to identify this quotient just with the structure group G. Um, now, all that remains when I take this quotient of, of, the, of the gauge transformation by the base, base gauge transformation is, um, is, is the gauge transformation on, on either of the two end fibers. So um, that's one copy of G which acts on the final fiber and one copy of G which acts on the initial fiber. And, and those two copies act to the left and the right of the polynomial. So, so this, this looks like a, um, uh, the action of, of G cross G on the, on the top, one copy acting on the left and one copy acting on the right. Now instead of uh, looking at the at the, the group of residual gauge transformations, I could look at the Lie algebra of residual gauge transformations. So they're just infinitesimal ones. Um, so that's what I'm going to do from now on. I'm going to just just give me and just allow me to forget this this group and, and just look at the Lie algebra. Okay. Um, yeah. So it's like, so this this is my residual gauge Lie algebra. Um, two copies of, of the Lie algebra, one acting on the left and one acting on the right in the structure group. Um, so eventually I'm going to be joining edges together, so I just want to, to clarify um, uh, some stuff that will appear in pictures later on. So if it, when, I, when I join edges together, I could of course just consider a single edge in isolation. So the whole thing along that, that, that individual edge is an element of, of my structure group. So I'm going to um, label that edge by, by my structure group, um, by a copy of my structure group, to remember that that, that edge contributes that much to my modulized space. Um, but, but I still have to remember the gauge, the gauge transformation, and um, that consists of one copy of the algebra acting on either side of my structure group. Uh, one copy acting at the end of the edge, and one copy act, acting at the start of the edge. So, um, so to, to display this information in pictures, I'll just label the, the edges by, by Okay. So let's now look at flat connections on the Houston class. So um, once again, I'm going to not model by the full gauge group, but by the base gauge group. So, so this gauge group will act as um, a normal subgroup of, of gauge transformations which, which act trivially at each of these vertices. Since I'm acting trivially at each vertex, I can still calculate the hole in the along, along the edges. So, so that gives me um, 
an embedding or a map that is intrinsically embedding in the quotient of the space of black connections modular the space nature transformations into three copies of the structure here. So the one copy of the structure is going to correspond to each edge. So this embedding is just it's the whole number of those edges. But of course it, it, it embeds as a subset, not as the as a full thing. Because uh, it, since the connections are bad, it's just simply connected to be total and omega gamma gravity has to be trivial. So um, so it's a subset of uh, of n tuples, or sorry, three tuples whose cyclic product is trivial. And uh, I'm going to call this quotient space, or so this space here, which is these n tuples whose uh, sorry, three tuples whose triple product is uh, so you typically call it this trivial. Um, we may call it the modular space of, of flat connections on a triangle, where, where, where we have to remember that I'm, uh, I'm not acting on the, at the at the but I get transformations. Um, and I'll, I'll use the symbols to know this. So I think of this as a as a labeled triangle where you know map those three vertices. And of course there's I have to remember what, what gauge transformations I haven't, I haven't used yet. So what are the residual gauge transformations? Well, um, so, so of course I have this embedding of, of my modular space of, of, for the triangle, which is the same class as the structure group, one half to each edge. And on each edge, I have to some residual gauge transformations. But I'm interested in the residual gauge transformations for the modular space of the triangle. And if I act at a, a vertex of the triangle, I have to act diagonally across that edge, uh, across that, that vertex. So I have to act on both ends of the edge, that edge of that vertex. So, so residual gauge transformations here are three copies of my Lie algebra um, embedded in, in this, this big Lie algebra as a diagonal uh, across each vertex. And, and, and of course, it's clear that this whole normal map is, is equivariant with respect to the residual gauge of the output for the triangle, which I'll open up by, by G delta. Um, are there any questions so far? Um, OK, so remember, I wanted to, uh, to construct my surface by, by piecing together some triangles. So how do we do that? Well, I take. Um, you know, say n copies of my, my triangle, the, or the corresponding modular space. And uh, um, using the whole domain map, I can embed that into three n copies of my structure group. So uh, one copy of the structure group for each of the three edges of the main triangles. Now, suppose I have a triangulation of my surface. So I fix my surface and I fix the specific triangulation uh, with, with, with n triangles. If I look at the one skeleton of, of that triangulation, I can use it to find a subset of, of, of my fan copies of the structure group. So how do I do that? Well, each edge of the triangulation um, comes about from gluing two ed the edges of two, two different triangles. And uh, so if I have a flat connection <laughs> over the full surface, the whole enemy along both those edges has to be the same. So I'm putting the whole enemies uh, uh, the two edges that I identify. So once I impose all these equalities, um, uh, one equality for each edge, I'm cutting out a subset here of, of my fan copies of my structure group. Now, I can take the free image of that subset along the whole domain map, and I, I get some other space. So what is this space? Well, um, a given element of this space assigns a whole domain to each edge of my one skeleton. Um, but it also has the additional requirement that the, whole, the fact that the whole moon is around any triangle is trivial. Now, this almost looks like our modulized space of flat connections for the surface, but um, I have to remember that there's still some residual gauge transformations. So I still need to take the quotient by the gauge transformations happening at each vertex. So, so what have I done? Well, I've, I've imposed some constraints on, on my initial um, modulized spaces. Then I've, mod I, I've quotiented out by some symmetries. So this looks like reduction. Um, and in fact, my constraints come about from by pulling back constraints along some map, which is equivalent with respect to those symmetries. 
So, so this actually looks like moment map reduction. So I want to understand this whole of me map and moment map. And, uh, and then construct the modulized space using, using moment map reduction there. OK, well, um, how do we interpret it as a moment map? Usually a moment map is, is a map from a Poisson map from a symplectic manifold to a Poisson manifold. And so far, we don't have any Poisson manifolds in sight. But in fact, uh, we, have a, we have something just slightly more general than a Poisson structure um, called a, a Dirac structure, which is, being, which is we've been talking about secretly this whole time. Okay, so where, where does that live? Well, this of all, we have the current algebra. So the current algebra comes out from, uh, from an edge. So uh, the base of the current algebra is the, is the structure group. So that's the, the whole thing along the edge. And the, uh, a typical, uh, the fibers of the current algebra are, are just the residual gauge transformations, so the residual gauge of the algebra. Uh, and the, the anchor map is just the, the action um, of this residual gauge of the algebra on the whole thing along that edge. The uh, current bracket is just given by extending the lead bracket, and the, um, the metric on the, on the fibers of the current algebra is just, uh, is just the extension of the, or it's just the project form on, on the early algebra. So, so this, is, this is a current algebra. Um, and uh, if, you, if you're not familiar with current algebra, it's not really because it's not really going to, um, it, 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 it's not going to play a huge role in, uh, in the talk. It's just, it's just the framework in which we're going to do reduction. And, uh, but you won't really need to know the details of what they are. Um, next, our residual gauge transformations for the, for the triangle can get the residual, the deflection of the residual gauge transformation for the disjoint collection of edges as a, as a drag structure. So, so this is the drag structure that we've been talking about the whole time. So we don't have a Poisson structure, but we do have this drag structure, which is a slight generalization of so we'd like to interpret this, this whole domain map as a, as, as a moment map for this graph structure. And uh, the, the, the framework that allows us to do that um, was written up in, in some paper by, uh, called Current Mor Morphisms and Moment Maps by, by Enrique and uh, David and, and Powell. Um, uh, so it, it, it sort of builds upon a, a bunch of other um, papers which also talk about um, moment maps in terms of graph geometry. But, uh, anyhow, um, so, so in fact, you can do this whole thing map as a moment map uh, for, for the action of, of the residual gauge of the algebra. And uh, there's a unique two form on, uh, on my modular space for the triangle, which allows you to do that. So, so that two form is written up here. So it's just uh, the left hand variant of our crack down form for, for this one edge, and the right variant of our crack down form for this other edge. Um, and it, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't look so symmetric here, because I mean, what is what about the square edge, but it is actually like a, a very symmetric definition. Um, the the, the uh, so, so why is this form unique? Well, um, you can think about it uh, by analogy with the, the plus one case. So say you have a, a, a moving map in the traditional sense, so a map from a symplectic, a plus one map from a symplectic manifold into a Poisson manifold. If, if the synthetic manifold is closed and that map is an embedding, then the, um, it has to embed as a collection of synthetic leads. And so the two form on that um, synthetic manifold is completely determined by the embedding. And it's the same story here. The two form is completely determined by the, by this, by, uh, by the fact that this whole domain map is a, a moment map. So, so I didn't just make up this, this two-form. It, um, it, it's really forced upon me by, by the problem. Uh, are there any questions at this point? All right. So what is the action? Um, so I, so the, the G delta, this um, residual gauge, the algebra for the um, modulized space of on uh, the triangle is just a few copies of, of the algebra acting diagonally there. So you can sort of see it. I've given a typical element here, Z, eta, and theta. 
and it acts on, on these two copies of the structure group. This, uh, this is here. So, so this, this Z acts on the right of this structure group. This data acts on the left of the structure group. And this data acts on the left of, well, of this structure group, etc. Um, and uh, this, this is embedded, of course, as a, a subset of that. So it's just the, and then it, um, just the corresponding action on the subset. So it's embedded as an invariant subset. Any more questions? Okay, so now let's talk about reduction a little bit. So remember, interpreting my whole and only map is a moment map. And uh, I had this quantum algebraic for grid in this graph structure. Um, but now you can just think of this as a very good map. It doesn't matter too much in this slide. Um, and, and this map is, of course, equivalent with respect to my like, residual gauge scale. Uh, so the residual gauge scale for the, the triangles. Um, now, to do reduction, I need to, to choose, um, to choose some, some reduction data to be used by. So how do I make that choice in this context? Well, I choose the Lagrangian subalgebra of the, um, of the residual gauge scale for the collection of edges, the disjoint collection of edges. So what do I mean by Lagrangian subalgebra? I mean, a subalgebra which is equal to its own annihilator. So you remember this, this, this is a quadratic free algebra, so we can, we can ask what, it's, what the annihilator of the effective space is, the subspace. So once I've chosen that, I can look at the orbit of that Lagrangian subalgebra to the identity. I take the pre image of that orbit along the whole the map, and then I'd like to reduce by, by symmetries. But I can't reduce by all of that, because of course, L doesn't, doesn't live inside the residual gauge of the algebra for, for my triangle, and, and it may not preserve the, the subset, have, uh, the, the subset um, defined by my triangle. So I have to intersect L with that residual gauge of the algebra. And, uh, and I take the quotient by this. And uh, this is exactly the right reduction procedure, because uh, we need to follow here. Uh, suppose L is with Russian with some alpha and there's some transversality assumptions. Then the, the two form um, restricts to, to the subset of uh, uh, the, the image of the of the orbit of the identity along the whole linear map. So the two form restricts to that and, and the sense of find some platform on the quotient. Okay, so now let's talk about So this is how we're, we're going to get a symplectic structure. So, um, any questions here? Okay, so, um, so I, I said that we can get some uh, synthetic structures by, by choosing Cal, but I, I'm going to have to show you that we can get the, some, the synthetic structure on the modular space. Um, so, so I have to show how to choose our fields and stuff in the space from this. So I'm going to do that next um, by just through a series of examples. So the first example is just sewing edges together. Suppose I want to um, have two triangles and I just want to sew the two edges together. I need to choose a Lagrangian subalgebra to do that by. So the Lagrangian subalgebra should be just a residual gauge the algebra for those two edges. So it's just going to live in the, there's four copies of the algebra. Two copies for, for each edge. And uh, since I just want um, you know, the connections and the, the, the whole one needs to, to match, I'm just going to choose the diagonal subalgebra. So if I act um, on the first edge by Z on the left and Z on the right, I'm going to act on the same way as on, on the second edge. So I'm, so I'm asking that my residual gauge transformations be, be identified along those edge along those two edges. And uh, in addition, the orbit through the identity, since I'm acting the same way on both edges, is just going to be the diagonal. So it's just going to be um, the subset where the, the whole numbers along those two edges are equal. So, so using this Lagrangian subalgebra, um, uh, when I reduce, I, I end up imposing equality as a whole numbers. I reduce by the same, uh, by the same residual gauge transformations, etc. And since the, the whole thing is equal up to some gauge transformation, the, the connections are equal along, along the edge. 
So, so I'm actually looking at connections which extend across the edge. So by using by this way algebra, I'm looking at the modular space of connections on the surface of constructed by sewing these two edges together. Okay, so, so that allows me to sew any two edges. And I can use one copy of, so if I have triangulation, I can, I can use one copy of that new algebra for, for every edge of my one, uh, my one skeleton. So I, I just place that new algebra at every, every edge of my one skeleton for, um, for the two copies of edges that I saw. And then I just reduce the whole thing by, by the direct sum of those new algebras. And, uh, and then uh, the reduction will we'll give you the modular space of flat connections and it will construct a symplectic structure on it. And, uh, yeah, so, so this, this constructs the correct symplectic structure on the modular space. In fact, it's, it's, it, it was forced upon us just by, by the problem. That, that two form was forced upon us initially. Um, okay, so now, I, so now I show how to construct the symplectic structure in the modular space of flat connections for, for you know, a basic surface like this. Um, but we can do more interesting things with this, this framework. So we could consider boundary conditions. Um, we can consider surfaces with boundaries, and we could consider boundary conditions. Okay, so um, I call that pulling edges. So um, edges of my boundary. So um, I'll be looking at pictures like this eventually. Okay, so how do I do that? Well, suppose, um, suppose I choose a coisotropic subalgebra of my quadratic algebra. So by coisotropic, I, I mean that it contains its own annihilator. Well, um, I might want to pull this edge by, by that coisotropic subalgebra. So I have to, to do that, I have to choose some Lagrangian mean subalgebra to reduce by. So the Lagrangian mean subalgebra is going to be a subalgebra of this. Uh, of the dual algebra for that edge. And uh, how do I choose it? Well, I, I choose the pairs Z and Eta, both of which lie in C, and the difference lies in, lies in the annihilator of C. So if I look at the orbit of, uh, of this algebra through the identity, I'm just looking at, uh, I, I, just get, um, I just get the lead group integrating the annihilator of C. <coughs> so, so when I reduce by, so I can, of course, if you have I can, I can reduce by, by this the algebra at that edge, by going, um, and, and get something some uh, And, uh, in, in that sense, I, that corresponds to restricting the whole domain to lie in C prep, and restricting the, the, the gauge transformations to lie in C. And so, by placing copies of, of that Lie algebra at edges along the boundary, I can I can construct the modular space of flat connections over colored surfaces. Um, so there's a flat structure on the modular space of flat connections over colored surfaces, um, where I color those, those the, the boundaries of those surfaces with various sorts of topic sub algebras. And of course, on a given boundary, there's no reason to color the whole boundary by a single course of tropic. I mean, I could split the, the, the boundary into several segments and color different segments with, with distinct cross-tropic sub Okay, so this It's not very interesting, but when we put some boundary conditions uh, on this on the square, it's something, something quite interesting. Um, so suppose we, we have two Lagrangian subalgebras of, of G. I might choose to color alternating edges of my square by those two Lagrangian subalgebras. And the, the theorem or, that I said above shows that the corresponding modular space has a symplectic structure. Okay, um, how do we describe the modular space using, using this, this framework? Well, um, I mean, we can describe it just using whole numbers. So, um, so we, we have a whole number on each edge, 
So, so this, this map, it, uh, it changes the identity. It's guaranteed to be transistor to identity if these two subalgebras are transistors. Um, just because they don't span the, the tangent space of the identity. So, yeah, so, yeah, so you, I mean, to, to, to talk about this quotient and to, to say that it might have a symplectic structure, you don't need, you don't, you don't need those transversality assumptions a priori. It's just when, when trying to, you know, explicitly describe the space. This is sort of like 
time moves well in this direction, then we can say reversibly in that side. That's these these are the various flexes you just move along through time. Um, anyhow, so you have uh, so, um, so so this surface has a has a boundary and in connections on the boundary, so so given given a connection on I'll say this surface, this surface, and this surface. Which live in the, the so, so that those are elements of the moduli space. If I can extend that connection across the, the interior, um, uh, then I, I sorry, the, the, the subset of connections on these boundaries, which I can extend across the interior, is a is a subset of three moduli spaces, and, and that subset is a, is a gap of the multiplication. Um, and, 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 and it's easy to check the you know, associativity just by you know, so then I have a copy of this here and you just deform everything. So. <coughs> you, you, I guess you might ask what's going on on the, on the other boundaries, but these, these sort of, there, there's sort of no moduli space on those boundaries because they live in some of the dungeons that offer. So the moduli space is sort of trivial Okay, so, so the next thing I'd like to do is, I mean, we, we've so, seen how to, to sort two edges and how to color a single edge by, by a course of topics on alpha. But what about, say, coloring two, two different edges by a course of topics on alpha? So, say I have a course of topics on alpha with the direct sum of two edges. Where, so, sorry, the direct sum of two quadratic alphas. Um, and, and so, sorry, so suppose I have two, two distinct quadratic alphas. So, A prior, they're, they're distinct. Um, and uh, it's just a course of topics I've offered in the direct sum. So I can I can play this game of trying to color color these two edges by this course of topics I've offered. So I need to choose a Lagrangian I've offered of the residual gauge that I've acting on those two edges. So how do I choose it? Well, I choose pairs Z Z prime and A to A to prime acting on the left and on the right, so that each pair lies in the course of topics I've offered, and the difference is lies in the annihilator. Um, and I, and when I color this edge, uh, when, when I reduce by this Lagrangian uh, set output, um, I can think of that as, as coloring this edge by this this course of traffic. And I, let's look at, at two examples, which you have, which you should which I just described already. So if G one is actually equal to G two then um, I could just QC to be the diagonal. So, so um, and, and then in this case, uh, coloring by, by C just corresponds to sewing the edges. I just act on, on, same way, on, on both edges in the same way. Then the orbit is just the, given by identifying the two polynomials uh, and by identifying the residual gauge transformation. So, so in, in this case, coloring this edge by that course of topic is just sewing the edges together. So, so, so this, on one hand, is a generalization of that, and on the other hand, if, if the second um, quadratic alpha is trivial, um, this just corresponds to coloring the first edge by the course of trauma. Okay. Um, so, so now using this Lagrangian sub alpha, I can color, color um, I, I, I can look at surfaces which are divided into different domains. So each domain will 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 uh, look at the moduli space taking values in a, in a distinct quadratic way alpha, very possibly the same. And then along the boundaries of those domains, I'm gonna, I'm gonna choose some quasi-tropic subalpha with a direct sum. So can color the boundary by that, by that quasi-tropic. And uh, and the theorem says that the corresponding moduli space should, should carry a synthetic structure. Uh, so so this way this way you can you can study so I can use much like states and get some back perspective on them. Yeah? In this case, the difference in the first one, the alphas are the same. Yeah, I mean, they should be entirely different than the alphas. I mean, you could choose them to be the same, but, but yeah, I'm, I'm allowing you to choose entirely different the alphas on, on different domains. 
Right, so I'm, I'm sort of, um, I'm, I'm, I'm having different sort of structure groups on, on different domains. So sort of, yeah. Um, right. Okay. So, um, so let's look at a, a specific specific example of these domain walls, which is Judith Philip Wolf. I, I think it, it might come up in this talk, right? At least I hope it will. Well. Um, but I uh, suppose um, G is given as a direct sum of three sub algebras, G minus G plus and H. So a vector space direct sum, not not really algebra direct sum. Um, and uh, if I take, say, u, u plus and, and the dress on the vector space dress on the of H, that's of course a traffic sub alpha. And similarly for um, u minus with the dress of H. So uh, this is just a vector space dress on. Typically, be, it won't be the dress on as, as, as the alpha. But... So, so in, in a typical application, uh, these this will be comparable sub algebra. Um, it can be the, the, the Levi sub, um, the, the semi simple sub algebra coming from the Levi decomposition, and, and it will, will be the, um, the, for the, the set of, uh, of roots for that, or uh, root spaces for that. And, uh, yeah, so, so I also ask that the annihilators of, of each of these sorts of sub algebra be here. Here's the sub algebra here. Okay, so I guess I'll just take this example here. And then I can tell you. So this means in particular that H is going to carry um, a quadratic form just by given by restricting the quadratic form on G. And so I can consider two domains, one colored by H and one colored by G. And I can look at the Lagrangian sub algebra given the following form. So um, uh, for, for elements in H, it just acts diagonally across. But the elements of U and U, um, elements of U just act on, on, the one, on the one side, the line. So, so, so this is a particular example of the course of topic I can use to, to do. Um, so, so, so one of the is the structure of the alpha G with one of the structure of the H. And uh, so in particular, one can look at the following picture. So uh, it, it's one thing just a cylinder. At one end of the cylinder, the cylinder I have G, on the other end I have H. And I haven't, I haven't glued them by a single edge, but by an alternating series of edges. Um, one. Uh, with, with the alternating copies taking values in L plus and L minus. And uh, the, the corresponding modulus space is still equal to this uh, fission space. Uh, here, you can it um, this way and it just looks like that. Um, and, and this particular drawing is for, for, for the number of R is equal to 3. And 3 is, is given by, say, like 3 copies of, of L minus and 3 copies of, of L plus here. So it's a, Hexagon with colored alternating edges with three copies of, of, of these two uh, course of travel. Okay, any, any questions about, about coloring like these domain walls? Okay. Um, so finally, I uh, I mean, it's easy to, to, to generalize this. Of course, you can you just take any collection of energies and just color that collection by, by some close tropic sub algebra of the direct sum. So you can imagine that it's, it, it's a small surface. And the little one direction sub algebra is just the, the generalization of, of the one in the previous slides for the single edge and picture edges. Um, okay, so. Let's look at, at, at an example of that. Suppose I suppose I, I don't want to change my structure group. Suppose I want my structure group to remain the same when I plot these branch points. And uh, so I'm telling these these this branch locus by some course of traffic sub algebra. Suppose I also want some sort of associativity. So um, I can I can sort of move those branch locuses past each other. Um, 
Well, then that requirement defines an associative multiplication on my lead algebra G. The square subtropic sub is a graph of an associative multiplication on G. Um, in particular, G becomes a lead group of some other lead algebra K. Uh, and, uh, okay, so um, let me explain this picture a little bit more. Um, so at a given, at a given graph focus, I have, I have three surfaces coming in. So I have three different connections as I approach that, that branch locus. And I'm not, I'm not asking that those connections agree along that branch locus. Instead, I'm asking that they, they be compatible, with the compatibility is determined by C. So, um, so here you can look at, at the initiative of C, it's just that the, the cyclic product is the identity. So, so you should interpret this as some sort of conservation law. I mean, you know, instead of the sum being trivial, the, the sum around the total sum being trivial, um, the, the total product here is trivial. So, so, so the, these, these surfaces are, are interacting at this locus. They're not, they're not just uh, things are just, just passing through them. There. There's some total, total thing that's conserved. And, and this, this, this sub of this C is just, just being put in your conservation law. Okay, so, um, and, uh, and there's some sort of classification of, of these. Of these, um, so suppose K is a, a lead, um, so remember, G, G lives as a group order of some other lead algebra K. So the classification is in terms of K. So if K is a lead algebra, then um, quadratic invariant elements of the symmetric um, space over K are in much more correspondence with quadratic lead algebras carrying this, this nice group order structure. Quadratic lead algebras over K. And uh, this, this quadratic lead algebra living, um, carrying a leading void structure over K is called the double load of the pair KMS. And uh, there's a, a nice possible geometric, geometrical interpretation of this, um, which is that, um, so, so you want to think of K with S in a super geometric perspective as, as being a, a plus one manifold. So, so the symmetric element S, you want to think of that as a plus one structure. Then integrating it to some, when you integrate it, you get a symplectic group board. And uh, this this field is not a generic um, uh, quadratic pairing, it's the symplectic group board. Uh, uh, of this side, uh, of this sort of um, five plus one space or whatnot. So, so that's where this, the fact that this is non degenerate comes in. It's, 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 it's more or less a symplectic form. And so, so then I could study managed surfaces and get some effective structures on their modular spaces. Okay, finally, since this is a Poisson conference, I should probably talk about Poisson structures at some point. I'm going to talk a lot about various synthetic structures. What about Poisson structures? Um, so, so this here is an example that's actually leading to that. Um, suppose here is a Lee Alfred and uh, uh, sorry, actually, are, are there any questions about, about these kinds of services at all? Um, so, suppose so here is a lead algebra and we choose some, uh, we have some uh, quadratic of the symmetric uh, space over that. Um, then, uh, and suppose this element S is non degenerate. Then, of course, I can invert it to get a quadratic form on my, on my lead algebra. So if I fix some surface and I look at the modular space at K connections over sigma, that gives a symplectic structure. Just by given by inverting S. Okay, what happens if we weaken this degeneracy to a non-degeneracy condition on S? What if we allow it to be possibly degenerate? Um, then we shouldn't expect a, a symplectic structure anymore, we shouldn't expect a Poisson structure. Um, okay. Uh, and how do we construct that? How do we, how do we see that that works? Well, we can just generalize this, uh, this framework that, that, I, that I gave for the symplectic one. So um, we, we call that um, K and S as a string called double, given by quadratic algebra. Um, so this uh, quadratic algebra acts on the structure group integrating uh, zero K, the algebra K. And uh, we model our modular space of factors over the interval by, by this kind of algebra given by GF and not K. So K is the, the, the structure group K gives a carpool on that line, 
and the residual gauge transformations are somehow in some sense included by the Leon Cortez, the G. Um, then we play the same game, we look at a modular space of uh, <coughs> connections on the, on, the, uh, on the triangle, and uh, we interpret the whole organism in the map. And then in the same way we do this moment map reduction to construct a <coughs> final space. Um, but in this case, we <coughs> this graphic, we'll get something plus all. So, um, and, and, and of course, you can generalize the whole, whole story and talk about you know, surfaces with domains, where a, a structured um, Lie algebras are no longer quadratic Lie algebras, but these, these Lie algebras with this, um, this uh, these elements S, which are allowed to be, um, these quadratic invariant elements, which are allowed to be degenerate. So, and, uh, and of course, the modulus will, will carry some cross -mostrum. So, so, so that's everything. Are there any questions?